to sing them in from the hallways because I know there's more people in the hallways. It was a crowded place to get through. So uh, we're going to start with You Are Good. We learned this last week, so let's stand and uh, proclaim God's greatness. Amen? Amen.
<laughs> I was in a fruit fire. <laughs> it was kind of exciting. <laughs> the other thing that, that uh, we forgot to mention is if you go in the foyer, you'll notice that there is a row of high chairs. Now, we're not having any kind of a race. Those are free. If anyone needs a high chair, they all work, and you may take them. Um, and if no one takes them, they will go to Salvation Army or Goodwill. Uh, we bought new wooden, like the restaurant type of high chairs, because they stack much easier and they store much easier. So if you need a high chair, or a grandkid needs a high chair, or you need a high chair when a grandkid comes, we have some available for you. So make, make yourself available to them. If you would stand, I want to read a passage in Romans, and then we're going to sing Strong God. Uh, Romans 8, 39 says, And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't, and life can't. The angels can't, and the demons can't. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, and even the powers of hell can't keep God's love away. Whether we're high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? So as we sing strong God, think about the areas of your life that God has shown himself strong, even this past week. Uh, and let's raise our voices in praise to our strong God. Yeah. 
Once in a while, I think it's good for us to praise God for answers to prayer. Amen. 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 Uh, yesterday morning, I, I think it was about four o'clock, I got the first message that little Gavin Schuler uh, was taken to the hospital here in uh, Salina and was just not doing really well. Nick and Trista, brand new parents, you know, Gavin's three weeks old. He's that little tiny one, you know, that fit in the side of my hand here. And, um, there were lots of issues, they did lots of blood work, and one of the things that they found was that his white count was literally off the charts, extremely high. And uh, they kind of panicked, but we don't have a, a really, really well-staffed NICU here at the hospital. We have great people, but not the facilities they have in Wichita, so they made the decision uh, to take little Gavin to Wichita, they took him down, before he left, um, Allie Harvey was working in the ER, or Allie Hayes, I don't know where my name is on it, Allie Hayes was working in the ER, and she just grabbed up the family and they all prayed and asked that God would just touch in an amazing way. Now the interesting thing is, about three hours later when all the blood work came back in Wichita, the white count was normal. Now, folks, you can't say that was a mistake. They checked it in Salina. They double-checked it in Salina. And we had people pray. And God heard an answer. Now, the good news is, uh, Gavin is doing well this morning. He's going to be in the hospital for a few days. He's having trouble gaining weight. He seems to be losing better than he's gaining. Uh, those of us who would like to go on a diet might talk to him when he gets a little older to find the secret. But he needs to gain about a pound to get out of the hospital, and so we're going to pray very specifically that way this morning uh, for little Gavin. I'm going to have Randy and Christy come down, and we're going to surround them at the altar on behalf of Gavin and Nick and Trista this morning, and just ask God to be especially near. We also want to pray today for Gail Hall. Uh, Gail is very near death. Uh, was with the family yesterday. Hospice has said 
maybe 48 hours. And so we want to just ask that God would be especially near, near to Gail today, to Carol and the boys, that he would just overshadow them in his grace. And then we also want to continue praying. Uh, this week we've been praying for Hank's daughter, and she's been in the hospital but got to come home yesterday, and that's exciting. Just ask that God would continue to be uh, with all of those special needs. You may have a need this morning that you've come to church with, something you maybe haven't shared with anybody, but it's big in your heart. We serve a strong God, folks. A God who's able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. But oftentimes, his hands are tied. Not because he can't, but because we haven't surrendered it to him. James writes in his epistle, we have not because we ask not. And this morning, God is saying to us, if you'll just cast your cares on me, I'll meet you where you are. And my grace is sufficient. Why don't you join me once again in standing. Let's prepare our hearts for prayer. And if you have a special need or you want to come and represent one of these needs, come and surround uh, Randy and Christy here at the altar. Let's just come before the Lord and ask him to intervene in ways that only he can. Okay.
suffer death for another. It's so far beyond our understanding, Lord, it's even hard to conceive, and yet that's exactly what your Son did for us. And this morning we are a people who live with forgiveness, freedom, and restoration to relationship with you because your Son, Father God, paid that price for us. And Lord, we say thank you. Thank you, Father. We also understand today that it is that same blood that conquers not only death but illness. And Lord, we read in the, the prophecy of Isaiah, in that 53rd chapter, Lord, that it was there, God, that you, through the stripes of Jesus, provided healing for us. And God, today, we just want to thank you for that healing. We've heard that, Lord, in what you did yesterday for little Gavin. In a span of a couple hours, Lord, you did what, what medically is not possible. And Lord, we give you praise and honor and glory for that. But we also recognize this morning that about 80 miles from here, there's a little boy laying in an NICU isolate with a mom and a dad sitting in chairs alongside today just needs a touch from you. And God, I'm thankful that you are the God who is not bound by distance, who is not challenged by need, who is not able to do more than we could ever ask or imagine. Today, in the strong name of Jesus, we pray healing on little Gavin. God, your word says that precious are the little children. Your word says they are a treasure gift to us, and that's exactly what little Gavin's band and Nick and Trista and the grandma and grandpa here at the altar and, and Aunt, Aunt Lexi here in church with us today. And God, we know that you have an incredible purpose for this little boy, and he'll have a story to tell of your grace and your power. And Lord, today we just claim his healing, and also, God, that you would encourage his mom and dad and his grandma and grandpa and all the family and let them know that you are a God who hears and answers prayer. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you, Lord, for what we know you're yet going to do. We claim victory today in the name of Jesus. And as we pray, Lord, for little Gavin today, we pray, Father, for one of our dear saints, for Gail Hall. Lord, he is a man who walks with you. A man whose testimony has literally transformed the life of his own kid. His whole family worships you. And it's been in part, Lord, because there's been a dad and a husband and a father who has lived for Jesus without shame. And God, today as he is coming to the end of this earthly journey, we just pray, Lord, that you would bless him, that you would comfort him, that you would keep him in this time. May his pain be minimal. May his transition from this life into your arms be something, God, that comes with peace, and may you be with this family in the midst of the journey. Lord, I'm thankful that you are the God who says, I will be with you in that valley of death. And Lord, that's not just true for those who are in that journey, but for those who are around that journey, surrounding ones they love. God, help them today. Lord, 
Lord, throughout this sanctuary, at this altar, in these pews, there are people with need. And today we just pray, God, right now, that you would be with each and every one. Father, on the walls of this sanctuary, there are the names, the initials of people who are living without you. Lord, for the last 18 months, we have prayed by name, by initial, for lost people living without a personal relationship with you to find Jesus. And God, once again this morning, we just come in, in, in keeping with that word in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, where it says, pray the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the harvest field. May, Lord, we be those workers. And God, as you grant us opportunity to touch lives and to share Jesus using words when necessary, God, help us just to be faithful. And may, Lord, the ministry of your grace fall on open and receptive hearts. That today, men and women, boys and girls, grandmas and grandpas, moms and dads, aunts and uncles, cousins, friends, family, would find Jesus. Now, Lord, be with us as we continue to worship today. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for the incredible ways that you've blessed us. As in a moment, as a part of our worship, we return to you our tithes and offerings. We ask God you've blessed every gift and every giver. And Lord, we'll give you praise in the name of Jesus. With all God's people.
Every once in a while, God sends someone into your life who is a kindred spirit. And uh, this past June, the Lord brought to the Kansas district into my life, actually long before past June, a very special friend and his wife. Uh, we welcome to the service this morning Pastor Dan and Debbie Broughton. Dan is our, our district missionary, really, encourager. He's the coordinator for church planting and church revitalization. And I've asked him to come this morning and to share a word with us and just bless us uh, with the word of the Lord today. Thank you, Pastor John. Can you hear me out there? Yep. All right, it's good to be in Salina First Church of the Nazarene. I believe this is our first time here at the church, and I think we've already made some friends as we've gone around and got a chance to shake hands with folks. Um, uh, this morning I'm going to be speaking on the topic of radical hospitality, but before I get into that, I just have a few statements that I want to make. Number one, we just absolutely love your pastor, and uh, we've got to hang out with him in Joplin this summer and up in Olathe, Kansas, and last March in Hutchinson, and uh, we really feel a connection with him and his pastor. We really appreciate uh, not only the friendship, but also the passion that he has and commitment not only to this church, but also to our district and to our region for reaching unchurched people. And he's a really crucial part of our team. And uh, can you do this help me this morning to show your appreciation? For your pastor? <laughs> a little love in there and that's always good to hear and then I want to just say thank you to this church for um, uh, getting behind Daryl and Sherry out in Larned as we have been working to restart that church and we're looking to do that all across the Kansas district uh, some churches people have just moved away and they've seen their better days and it doesn't look too bright of a future for them but we've learned if we go through a process and find the right pastor person to go in there that we can see these churches turn around and actually some of their best days could be ahead of them but we can't do it without a church like you so can you help me uh, just to encourage each other here today as you step behind Cheryl and Cheryl and Cheryl and Lauren and Cheryl and all right and then other, one other thing that I want to brag on you guys about is throughout the Bible it always mentions this and and I, I read through the Bible every year, but I just begin to notice that over and over, the Bible says that we should be there for the widow, the fatherless, and the alien or the foreigner or those that are new to our country. And your church has reached out to the Hispanic folks. And um, can we do it one more time? I think that's awesome that you're doing that. So we, I'm not going to ask you to clap anymore, okay? But anyway, I'm just excited about all these things, and you need to just reach back and pat yourself on the back a little bit. You don't have to physically do that, but you guys are doing good, and I want to brag on you just a little bit this morning. This morning, I want to talk about the subject of radical hospitality in just a little bit. I'll be reading from the book of Luke, chapter 10, verses 30 through 35. If you have your Bibles, if you have your smartphone, if you have your technology, I don't even know what it is. You get it up. It'll also be coming on the screen a little bit. But I want to talk on this subject of radical hospitality. It was many years ago, and uh, I was dating this girl named Debbie. Uh, that's the same young lady that is my wife today. Debbie, can you wave at everybody out there? She doesn't want any attention to herself, so I do that every once in a while. I get in trouble. Do you understand that at all? But anyway, I was dating her, and she decided it was time that I met her grandma, Martha. Now, Grandma Martha, Debbie had spent most of her summers with her growing up, lived in Nitchi, North Dakota. Anybody ever been to Nitchi, North Dakota? It's a half a mile from, my wife raised her hand, it's a half a mile from the Canadian border, and she was really close with her Grandma Martha, and evidently she thought enough of me that she wanted me to go up and visit her. Well, it was two hours away from where we lived, and so I went and picked her up, and, and we uh, got ready to go early in the morning so we could spend the day two hours up and two hours back, and... Um, but I just was a little bit hungry, so I decided to stop at a restaurant and, you know, just get a little bit of breakfast. You know what I mean? A couple eggs, hash browns, toast, uh, maybe a pancake, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, coffee, all those different things. And I was feeling pretty good as we drove two hours to Grandma Martha's. But when I opened the door to her home, I knew I'd made a cataclysmic mistake by eating breakfast that day. 
Because the aroma of all of that food that she had cooked was, was, was just surrounding me. And Grandma Martha was this kind of lady that sat right on the edge of her chair and looked right into your eyes and listened to you and smiled. And she was one of these people that within five minutes, I felt like I'd known her all my life. And back then, I, was, I still drank coffee. I've been delivered, by the way, from coffee. Uh, it's hot tea now. So, but anyway, I was still drinking coffee, and you know, do you know these kind of people that the coffee cup is never dry all day long for like six to eight hours, it never gets below half full, always jumping up and filling up, and the conversation was so great, and she made some pastries and some cookies for us, and we were drinking coffee and snack, and we already got breakfast right here, and we got all that stuff, and all of a sudden she said, it's time to eat, and you know, she was, you know, she grew up on a farm, and she married to a farmer, and you know the biggest compliment that you give someone like Grandma Martha? Eat as much as you can, amen? Do you know what I'm talking about? And so I sat down and we did the whole thing. And she'd just come over and put more food on my plate. Have you met those people like that? And then I ate as much as I could. And then Grandma Martha stood up and smiled and said, I made two homemade pies. And two different kinds of ice cream. And I just said, say, time out, Grandma Martha. I need this to sit for a little bit, okay? And then there was more conversation, more coffee, and then pie and ice cream, and then more snacks, and then more food. And, you know, Grandma Martha was something. My wife says that when she was a girl, they would go to a restaurant, and somebody needed coffee. Grandma Martha would run back in the kitchen, grab the coffee pot, and on the way back, fill everybody's coffee cup up and just see how they're doing, visit with them. She said sometimes it was almost they had to pull the coffee cup out of her hands. See, Grandma Martha just really, really loved people. She wanted them to feel loved and accepted, and she practiced what I call radical hospitality. By the way, I made a note to self. <coughs> always go to Grandma Martha's with an empty stomach, and I always did that after that. Now, I want to read a scripture that Jesus talked about many things, but one of the things that he talked about was radical hospitality. If you've been going to church for some time, it's a familiar story. If you're not, this is a narrative or a parable or a story that Jesus told, beginning with Luke, chapter 10, verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him, and away, went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite. When he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side, but a Samaritan. As he traveled, came to the, where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins, and in that day that was significant, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. This is the word of the Lord. Now, Jesus told this story, and this is a story or a parable about compassion, about how there are people in need, and how sometimes we are just too busy living our life or sometimes doing other things that we just kind of pass them by. On the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, this happened quite a bit. People were robbed, beaten, and left for dead. And after a while, you just kind of get immune to that. You just kind of seen it, and you know it doesn't move your heart anymore. And that's what happened to people. Now, Jews and Samaritans they hated each other, but here is the Samaritan who has compassion for this Jewish individual and demonstrates radical hospitality. He takes him to the inn. He pays for his stay. He watches over them, and when he has to go, he says, you know, I'll, I'll reimburse you for any expenses you have. I'm going to come back and do that. You know, this story moves us to be more compassionate, to be more aware of the needs of others. So it is a, it is a narrative of compassion. But you know there's more meaning in this story? Did you know that everyone needs Jesus? Everyone needs Jesus. No matter how cultured you are, or how educated you are, no matter what family or what church you grew up in. The bottom line is that everyone needs Jesus. The Bible says that all, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That's eternal separation from God. 
See, sin, like the man from was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, it, 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 it robs us. It, 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 it leaves us laying there half dead. That's what sin to us in our life. Uh, for many years, I lived away from God and away from the church. And sin has a way of weighing you down spiritually and dragging life out of you and leave you feeling robbed and half dead. And people need someone like the Good Samaritan to help them to connect with Jesus. Think back just a little bit. Was there a Good Samaritan in your life? Well, there was someone in your life that helped you to connect with Jesus. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher. Maybe it was a parent or a grandparent. Uh, maybe it was a friend, a camp counselor, or someone that worked with you in children's church or Sunday school, or a friend. But just think back. I bet in your life there's more than one person that was the Good Samaritan that knew that you need Jesus and went out of their way to make a difference in your life. See, there are a lot of needs in this world, but the greatest need for all individuals is to have a connection, is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the world's greatest need. I work with a church planter in western South Dakota. He, he lives on the Rosebud Reservation. His name is Ed Parcells. And Ed, when he was a young man, was abused by his dad, and then he went to live with his mom on the reservation, and he wasn't all Native American, and he didn't look like a Native American very much, and so he was persecuted by his own people, and he just, as a teenager, began to get into drugs and alcohol, and he just began to ruin his life. He was working for a guy by the name of Jim Wazorik in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and he used to have to go down, Jim did, and get him out of jail all the time to take him to work. And one day he went down there and he said to Ed, he said, I'm not going to get you out of jail anymore unless you promise me that you'll start going to church with me. Well, Ed had no other option, and so he started going to, to church with Jim because Jim was this good Samaritan. And you know, Ed had never really heard about how God loves all people and how Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of our sins and heal us from our dysfunction and deliver us from our addictions. And it wasn't long that Ed began to walk with Christ. And now that Ed is walking with Christ, he wants to help his people. And so on two different reservations in South Dakota, he's starting these churches that are called Bible Recovery Fellowships. And by the way, we had two churches given to us to use this on the reservation. Isn't that awesome, what's happening? And there are now over 100 Native Americans are experiencing the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And one day I was talking with Ed. Ed lives in Mission, South Dakota, on the Red Bud Reservation. And he talked about how their county is the second poorest county in the United States. There's maybe a county in West Virginia that's poor, but then it's his county in South Dakota. He was talking about all the needs that they have there. And I said, Ed, what can we do to help your people? And he said, well, Dan, I have a very simplistic answer. Would you like to hear it? I said, that's how Ed talks to me. I said, yeah, I would like to hear it. He said, the best thing that we can do for this poverty is tell people about Jesus. The best thing that we can do is tell people about Jesus. Because when we tell them about Jesus and they open their life to Christ, it's not long before God begins to deliver them of their unhealthy, dysfunctional habits. It's not long before he starts bringing families back together in marriages. It's not long before they get a job or start a business or start making artistic type things and selling them. It's not long until prosperity begins to come to their family and health and wellness. There's all kinds of needs here, he said, but the greatest need is letting people know about Jesus. And you know, there's even more truth in this story. The priest of the Levite, in the story represents pastors and church members who sometimes are not just too busy with life, but they're busy with religious things, with committees and meetings. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. But sometimes we get so active doing good things in church that we just don't have time to see the individual that needs a good Samaritan, to show radical hospitality and to bring them to Jesus. Sometimes it's not that we're too busy. And by the way, I just picked this up. Evidently, we have some names on the wall over there. Those are some people that need Jesus, the initials or the name. I'm glad that your church is doing that. And you have an opportunity to be a good Samaritan to them. But sometimes, it's not that we're too busy. Sometimes we just don't know how to help. But here in this scripture, Jesus teaches us how to practice radical hospitality. 
What would happen if all of us begin to demonstrate radical hospitality to the unchurched around us? What kind of a difference would it make? So this morning, I want to give you three ways to demonstrate radical hospitality. I'm not going to get into how you do this in your home, or how you do this through your hobbies, or how you do this in your work and school. I'm just going to take a look at it through the church, how we can practice radical hospitality and be a good Samaritan to the unchurched around us. Number one, you want to write these down, you can. Some of you have a great memory. Some of you can. My uh, teenage daughter was in church one day with me, sitting beside me, and she was on her phone. I said, stop texting. She said, Dad, I'm, Dad, I'm taking sermon notes on my phone. So you can do that, too. But anyway, the first way to show radical hospitality is through invitation, to invite people. Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter 22, verse 9. Therefore, go, or go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone. I remember that first growing up. It's something like going to the highway to the hedges and compel those to come. Invitation is one of the great ways that we can show radical hospitality. John Wesley taught us about provenient grace. Have you ever heard that word? Uh, I don't know if I know exactly all that it means, but let me explain it to you a little bit this morning. John Wesley taught us that God's grace goes ahead of us even before we we're followers of Jesus. In fact, Jesus said, my father is always at work. God is always out there ahead of us. You know those names that we have up on the bricks on the wall? God is already working in their life. Do you believe that? Do you believe in Provenia Grace? I think we forget that sometimes. God is always at work. I know in my experience, when for years I was away from God and away from the church, there were seasons when I begin to think in my life, I begin to question, what's life all about? What is after death in this life? You know, what did the Bible say about that again? And then there was times when God seemed very distant in my life. But God was always pulling, but sometimes I was closer to him. In, in, in the world today, we're told people from other cultures that have never heard about God, we're told that when people tell them about Jesus, that almost 50% of them say, you know what? I had a dream of that Jesus that you told me about. I had some kind of a premonition or a vision about this Jesus that you told me about. That's because the Father is always at work. <laughs> the Bruno Roddy, who was the regional director for South America, and through his leadership, thousands and thousands of people came through Christ, spoke at our church in Kansas City, and this is what Bruno Roddy, to an interpreter, said. He said that when we reach out to the unchurched, that God does 90% that God does, take two, okay? That God does 97% of the work, and that we do three. That was a couple decades ago when I heard him say that. But he's exactly right. God is doing all the hard work in the lives of unchurched people around us. All we need to do is 3%. But God needs our help. He needs us to be that good Samaritan. He needs us to go out and help them to connect with Jesus Christ. He needs us to invite them to worship. They could be children, they could be teens, they could be family, they could be friends, someone that you go to school with. They need to be invited to hear about Jesus. My wife and I are so proud of this, these grandparents in Kansas City. Uh, every morning they get up, I don't know what time they get up on Sunday morning, but by 645, they've driven 40 miles across the city to pick up two of their grandchildren. Then they drive another 50 to 20 minutes to another suburb, pick up three more of their grandchildren, and then take them 40 minutes across town to their church. After church, they take them, they do the whole trip back again. So they make that trip four times every Sunday they do that. And when there's activities at the church for their grandchildren, they do the same thing. That's what you call radical hospitality. That's caring about people enough that you'll make that time, that you'll do something extra, that you'll be willing to invite people that will come to church. There's all kinds of children and teens and people out there that want to know Jesus. In fact, 80% of the people in the United States of America today are unchurched. 80%. Where malls are open, Sunday is the biggest shopping day in most cities. Where people get their hair done, Sunday morning is the busiest time. It's the hardest time to get your hair scheduled. I just learned that from talking to people who cut my hair. And did you know that 80% of the people in America don't go to church? But 80% of them say they would if they were invited by a friend. If they were invited by a friend. That's just crucial. So what we need to do is we need to show radical hospitality in our life. 
And as we show that radical hospitality, that love and that acceptance, and folks, that means that we have to start looking down and judging and preaching at people and truly start loving them. Because I was lost, and a lot of people, they just by, just by their body language, I knew they were condemning me. But there were other people that were full of God's love, and they were showing that radical hospitality to me. And we have to start doing that. And then, folks, listen carefully. We cannot give up. We cannot give up. My wife, when we were in North Dakota, uh, lived in North Dakota. She worked for Easter Seal. And her specialty is working with uh, little children. And we were praying for those little children this morning that have special needs and uh, that have uh, serious physical needs and probably are not going to be on this planet very long. It won't be long until they're with Jesus. And she watched with one little red-haired girl named Lucy. And her mom, I think, was 17 years old at the time that we started watching her little uh, baby girl. And um, she was just so shy that she wouldn't even hardly talk to us. And, you know, she was always dropping off her little daughter, or we were going over there to get her. And, and, and anyway, she was so shy, but my wife just reached out to her, just, just loved her. And even though her lifestyle was different and everything else, just for the next two years, just loved her. After a while, my wife was talking and visiting with her. She'd give her a hug whenever she left, telling her how beautiful and wonderful her little baby girl was. And then after a couple years, uh, Lucy passed away went to be with Jesus. And her mom called me up and, and said, um, you're a pastor, right? I said, yeah. And she said, can you do the funeral? And I said, what, what would you like? Is there scripture? Is there songs? And she said, I've never, ever been in church before. Never. So I don't know what to do. And so I kind of walked her through it. And the first time that she ever was in a worship service with the gospel presented was her daughter's funeral. And then we just continue to love her. Every once in a while we get together and stop by her work and say hi and go to buy her lunch and visit with her and things like that. And I think it was maybe about a year later that it was a Saturday night my wife received a text from this young mom. And the text said, some of my friends have started going to your church. And I want to tell you something. When you're praying for people and showing radical hospitality to them, this is just so much fun, man, when this happens. Because we know now that God has been working in their life. And she ran out and gave that text. And, you know, we don't dance too much. Except we jump it around a little bit. And we said, what do we do? What do we do? And we said, well, in a couple of weeks, we're free on Sunday. How about if you come to the church and visit your friends with us? And, you know, after all of this time, here we were, sitting in a worship service with our friends. We'd never really been in a church service like that before. And being involved in prayer and worship and, and, and all of these aspects that draw us closer to God. And this is the whole key, folks. Don't give up. Do you hear me this morning? Keep inviting. For years, there was this lady in our hometown that invited us to church over and over and over and over again. I didn't know, but she'd been praying for me since I was in eighth grade. And every time we went to the store and we'd see her, my wife would say, there's Louise over there. She's going to come and invite us to church. It never hurt our feelings. It never hurt our feelings. And when we decided to go to church, guess who was there? Guess who got to see us first? It was a lady that had been praying and inviting us. So invitation is so important. You ready for the second one? Invitation is a way to show radical hospitality and then welcome. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 35, the Bible says, and Jesus says these words, I was a stranger. Say that word with me. Stranger. Can you say it one more time? Stranger. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. Not only is invitation a way to show radical hospitality, but also welcome. Let me ask you a question today. What do you do to get ready for company? What do you do to get ready for company? Nothing? Well, I want to tell you something. Whenever we have company, and we know company's coming over, my wife goes through and, you know, she has this whole thing that she does. She cleans the whole house. Uh, if we're having a gathering in our house with several people coming, she does what I call the deep clean, you know? I mean, the towels are all folded right. It goes through the doors and all those different things. I've learned that when this happens, that it's, you know, sometimes it's, when the kids were younger, I just get them out of the house and let her go. You know, sometimes I just get in her way. And then, you know, when we're having a gathering there, not only does she do this, but she has a list for me. Husbands, dads, you know, you know about this? You know, there's some things in the backyard that need to be done, some things in the front yard that need to be done, and, you know, there's some things in the garage that need to be done, up on the deck that need to be done. And one time, several years ago, I was doing this list, and I thought, what's going on? You know, we have to have some people coming over. And I realized, oh, yeah, it's my birthday in two days. 
<laughs> so I went into the house. I said to my wife, uh, so, so who's coming for my surprise birthday party? She didn't stop vacuuming. I mean, when my wife vacuums, she doesn't stop vacuuming. She just, you know, she gets that look on her face. You better get out of her way. You know what I mean? She never said a word for two days. I said, oh, who's coming to my surprise birthday party? And then there was my birthday, and all of a sudden the house was full of people. She couldn't keep it a secret because she was so busy getting ready for company. I want to ask you this question. What do we do on Sunday mornings to get ready for company? Do we work that hard? Are we ready to do that? Are we praying? Are we having our attitude right? Are we ready for company? Are we going out of our way to do that? Because you know, you never know on what Sunday there will be a stranger that needs to be welcomed. Now most of you, maybe not all of you, but most of you have been going to church for years. You know exactly how it feels here. You don't have any anxieties before you come here. You just come here and you know your friends, you know the routine. It just feels like, you know, going over to the grocery store. It's not that big of a deal. But if you haven't gone to church for a while, or if you've never gone to church, you, you feel like a stranger. It's a huge thing to come to church. Years ago when God was working on my life, I was out playing guitar with a friend of mine in my hometown on a Sunday afternoon. We did a bunch of different songs, and then we started doing some gospel songs. And he said, Dan, I need to play a, a song at church tonight. Why don't you come and do this with me? And I wasn't all the way in, but I was test driving Christianity in my mind. I, I hadn't gone to church yet or anything. I started to read the Bible and things like that. And I remember going back to my home church. I hadn't been there for years. And I remember having my guitar in my hand and getting in the parking lot and going, boy, this is awkward. I wonder what people are going to think. I wonder what people are going to say. You know, you just don't know what's going to happen in there. And then I remember coming to that door of the church, the church that I'd grown up in, but hadn't been there for maybe 10 years. And I remember standing there, and it was so difficult to reach out my hand and open up that door. It seemed like everything in the universe didn't want me to do that. But I remember opening the door and walking down the hallway, and all of these people visiting each other, and I'm standing there with my guitar. And on all of a sudden, this guy, who was unchurched at one time, far away from God, and he'd come home to God. His name was Dick, and he saw me, and he walked over to me, and threw his arms around me. He said, welcome home, Dad. You don't know how important that was in my spiritual journey. It was almost like God himself has said, you're not a stranger here. You belong here. It was important. That's why at our church plants, I encourage them to have people that open the door for you. And it's, you know what? Bulletins are important. I, I, I don't know if we get to heaven without bulletins. I think they're important. I hardly ever read them. I'm sorry. I, that's one of my failings, okay? I think it's a good to have a bulletin, but there's something way more important than that, folks. That's a warm person with a big smile on their face. And at our church plants, we need warm, growing people because you never know what a stranger is coming. And you know what? God is welcoming them, and we need to welcome them. I read about a church where someone invited a young single mom to come to church. And she was coming to church, and she hadn't probably gone to church much in her life. And, 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 she, and she was sitting there among the congregation, and she had this little baby. And you know, sometimes it's really hard for mom to check a baby into a nursery. It really, it really is. And, 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 and so anyway, she was holding the baby, and every once in a while the baby would get fussy. And you could see that she was concerned that she was disrupting everything. And they said, man, we got to do something. we got to do something. So they took real quick action. You know what they did? They bought a rocking chair, and they put it in the church. And they went over to that lady and said, your baby doesn't disrupt our work. We're glad your baby's here. We're glad you're here. And it's a baby. It's supposed to be that rocking chair here for you. You know, it wasn't long before they had several rocking chairs in that church. This is radical hospitality. This is welcoming people. This is what we do spiritually to make a difference for God. So we invite. Can you say invite? We in welcome. Can you say welcome? And then number three, we involve. You ready for this? Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Jesus didn't say, get your act together, abide by the special rules of Emmanuel, and all of those other ones that we've made up over the years, and then follow me. But Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, follow me. Come as you are. 
and I will make you fishers of men. Did you know Jesus did about three years of public ministry here on earth? And so it was absolutely crucial to start his kingdom. But do you know that he did the majority of his ministry with skeptics, seekers, and new believers? People that were just test driving faith. Do you realize that was Jesus' ministry team? I, yeah, he did have some religious, he had a religious scholar on there. He had a conservative Republican in his day. He had a progressive Democrat in his day. Must have been kind of fun when they went on those long road trips, huh? Like, like two table, table companies going together. Jesus had all this, but the most of his ministry team were skeptics, seekers, and new believers. See, Jesus wanted them to belong, and then to believe, and then to behave. And that's how he built his kingdom. This is really crucial where I'm at. I know sometimes when people like myself are speaking, we drift away. I had an engineer in our church in Missouri. And, and he said that he designed some of his best equipment when I was speaking, so it's okay if you drift away. But, but, but I kind of really want you to get this. Jesus, this is how he did ministry, that we belong, then we believe, and then we behave. It was very important for him, follow me. You're part of this. You're part of something bigger than yourself. But somehow, we kind of got this backwards in the church. See, we want people to behave. And then we want them to believe. And then we want them to belong. And this seemed to work in the church culture, but have you noticed our nation, our culture has really changed? We're not a church culture anymore. People haven't grown up in church anymore. And people have hardly gone to church in, in mainline denominations. And so they really don't know all of this stuff. And so they need to know that they belong. We need to start doing ministry Jesus' way. But to make that shift, to make that shift is very, very difficult. I was in a church planting assessment several years ago in Kansas City, Missouri. There was two or three district superintendents there and some very successful church planters. I got to be part of that. I got to be an assessor. And there was, I think, about 10 or 12 different couples that over a three-day period were being assessed if they had the giftings and the graces to be church planters. And I remember I, I was assigned to do an interview with a lady, an African-American lady by the name of Alice. And I hadn't seen her husband all week. And they said, you'll be meeting with Alice and her husband. I said, I haven't seen him all week. Because when we do these assessments, you always have the, the pastor and the spouse there. And they said, he'll be there for the interview. And so I went in to do the interview. And there was Alice, just a, this wonderful Christian lady. She finished seminary and been part of Kansas City First Church. The pastor really loved her. And she just shared how she had a passion to go in the very poorest part of the city and reach out to people there that really needed Jesus so much. And then I turned to her husband, Philip. I said, Philip, tell me your spiritual journey. And, and he said, well, I grew up Jewish, uh, but I'm an agnostic. I'm an atheist. I really don't believe in God. You know, I just sat there and cried, whoa, okay, all right, good. And, and I, I asked him a few questions. I said, what do you think about your wife's faith? He said, I know that her faith really helps her. And I know there's a lot of people in our neighborhood, in the city, that need her faith. And I'm not against her. I'm just an atheist, that's all. I'm not against her. I support her. And, but he said, and if she ever gets something going in her house or in a, in a building in our community, uh, I like to cook. He just lit up. He said, I really like to cook. And he said, I just love to, you know, if she got something going on, you know, I wouldn't be part of that at all. I wouldn't interfere with that. But I make a big meal afterwards for the folks. And so we got down and I prayed for them. And I went back to the team and they sat around and he said, what are we going to do? And Alice has this face, she has this vision. Her husband's an atheist, an agnostic. What are we going to do? And we just sat around for a while. And finally, our district superintendent said, well, you know, I know Alice. And I know her passion and all these different things. And I think her husband's going to support her in it. And, you know, we're not going to put any money into this. She's going to go in the city. We don't know if she's going to get anything going or not. So why not take this risk? And we said, oh, amen. So we sent her out. We had Alice come and speak at our church. Our church gave a $1,400 offering for her. I took her out, we took her out to lunch. And I said, you have started an account. I showed her how to register a new church and, 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 and set up an account for the church. And this will give you some, some funds to get some, some things going. And, and Alice just went out in the parks and out on the streets and began to meet people and to share radical hospitality, to share Christ's love. And today, if you go into the inner city in Kansas City, you'll see a brick building with the name True Light Church on there. Pastor Alice Figgy Wallach. And on a hot summer day, 
it's open all the time, you, not during the night, but you can come in and have a nice cold glass of water. There are people there that will greet you and welcome you. And there's Bibles there, and Christian books that you can read. When the snow is flying in the wintertime, they always got the coffee on. And there's Bibles to read, and there's Christian books there. Every Sunday, Alice preaches the true light Christian gospel and tells people about Jesus. And as the church is growing, every Sunday, Bill cooks, cooks a meal for everyone there. And by the way, Bill's in. Bill's a Christ follower. See, there's people out there that will never get it until they do it. There's people out there that will never get it until they do it. So we have to quit acting like there's insiders and outsiders. We need to start doing ministry like Jesus. So when we're doing acts of compassion, and when we're reaching out and we're doing things like that, invite people along on the journey. That's what Jesus did. When we start new churches, we train church planters to have a list of people that they need that are not Christ followers to help them start this church. You don't need to be a Christ follower to have a smile and greet someone. You don't need to be a Christ follower to play the guitar or the drums or the band. You don't need to be a Christ follower to do a whole bunch of stuff in the church. And we need to include them and do that. We can't wait for them to behave and believe. We have to allow them to belong first. And when they belong, guess what? It's just usually a number of weeks before they start believing. It's incredible what happens when they belong. It's not long before they start believing. And so I'm here and you're gathering here on next Saturday. Pastor John, the terror cross down. That sounds like fun. That's not, I can do demolition. Demo, what's that word? Demolition. I can't do restoration, but I can do demolition. Uh, bring somebody along. Bring a friend. Let them know that they can be part of something bigger than themselves. The kingdom of God. Show them radical hospitality. Begin to do this in your life. Allow the grace and the love of God to penetrate your heart, and, but don't hang on to it. Don't be selfish. Let it go out to others around you. You know, several years ago, that this church right here, if I got my story right, I think you'll be able to correct me if I got it wrong, but this church right here, an unchurched couple walked in the doors, and you accepted them, and you loved them into the kingdom. You involved them in the church. And now you've sent them out to Larned, Kansas. Daryl and Sherry Ripple made a huge difference in their life. I just want to share with you this morning, keep it up. There's a whole bunch of other people out there like that, that are unchurched, that are far from God, but God is tugging on their hearts. Don't give up, folks. Don't give up on them. Let's keep praying for those bricks and those names that represent real individuals who need to know Jesus Christ. Don't ever, ever, ever give up. The best way for us to show God's love to others is to demonstrate radical hospitality. Everyone needs a good Samaritan to bring them to Jesus. And we can do this by inviting, welcoming, and involving others in our church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for this church. This is a great church. This is an awesome facility. There are great people that I've met here today, just briefly, but I've met them. And then we have this great God. Wow, you are a great God. And you can do incredible things in people's lives. You can snatch people from the darkness and bring them into light. You can snatch them from dysfunctional patterns and lifestyles and habits, and you can bring them into healthy relationships. You can do so many good things, God. And the world today is not looking to go to church. But they're looking for people that will be the church. And that will demonstrate your love through radical hospitality, just like the Good Samaritan, just like Grandma Martha. I didn't have to behave for her. Her granddaughter brought me to her house. She put it all together. She went out of her way to show her acceptance and love. Can we be more like Grandma Martha? Can we be more like the Good Samaritan? Give us eyes to see those that you're working in their life on. Help us to continue to pray. Lord, I'm praying this morning for that lost son, that lost
lost daughter, that lost grandchild, that lost wife or husband. I'm praying for them this morning. Help us never to give up, Lord. And those people down the street or at our school or at our work that we really never really noticed before. They might be going through all kinds of issues. Financial issues, health issues, relational issues, all types of issues. And they're curious. They wonder if there's some help from above. Help us to remember them. And help us to reach out together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Therefore. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God is good. Amen. 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 Thanks, Pastor, for your word this morning. God bless. Have a great time in Sunday school. We'll see you back tonight.